So turn to Titus chapter 1. We're going to continue Titus chapter 1. And I don't know if we'll get all the way through the last three verses today or not. It's a good possibility, but, <clears throat> but we'll see what happens. Um, so Titus chapter 1. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start reading in verse 12. We'll read down through verse 16, uh, and then we'll get going there. So Titus chapter 1, verse 12 through 16. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith not giving heed to, to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their, their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Father, we thank You for the opportunity that we have to study your word. We're thankful that you've preserved it uh, throughout the ages, throughout the years, that we can have it in our own language, that we can read it and study it, and then take that information and apply it in our daily walk, that, uh, that we might be to the praise and the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So, uh, as we've come down in, in, in the book of Titus so far, we've gone through, I think this is what, the 19th total um, but it's number 17 as we've gotten into the, to the, to the verses themselves. Uh, we've started off talking about who Paul was, right? And that's what we started off with. Paul talked about what does it mean to be a servant. What, we found out that what that means is your body's not your own, right? And so what should we use our body for? To do this, to read, to study, to live it. That's what we're supposed to use the body for. Uh, we, we went over and talked about in Romans chapter 12. That's what Paul says. That's the purpose of us as Christians, as people who are alive today in the dispensation of the grace of God. That's what we're supposed to do. Preach, get people saved, bring them to the knowledge of the truth. That's it. Um, and that's one of the things we got through and we started talking about. That's what it means to be a servant. And we talked about what does it mean, what does it mean, what it meant for Paul to be a, a, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Um, then we talked about um, really going through in, in you know, and you notice there in, in chapter 1, verse 3, he says, But in, hath, in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. One of the things that we've talked about before, and we spent some time with it on verse 3, is who is it that this information was manifested to? Um, it was manifested to Paul, no one else. Right? Um, there's God didn't talk to some other apostle or prophet at that time during Paul's time and said, hey, here's a little piece of the mystery. He gave every bit of it to Paul. Every bit of it. He didn't piecemeal it between Paul and other people. It was committed unto my trust. He committed it to me, to Paul, and Paul alone. Nobody else. He didn't reveal a little bit to other people. Um, and there's actually people that teach that he did. And that's just ridiculous because you've got so many verses that says it's committed to Paul. It's his trust that God committed it to him. Um, then, then he gets into, Titus, here's why I've left you at Crete. So there's obviously some churches that are operating in Crete. And what Paul says to, to Titus is, I want you to go in and I want you to set things in order. Find out the things that are lacking. Find out the things that are wanting and restore order. All right? And we've talked about this before. The order isn't that here's an elder, here's a deacon, here's a bishop, or here's a bishop, here's a deacon, here's a um, music of ministry guy, and here's the lead Sunday school. That's, that's not the order that he was talking about. All right? And we notice that because if we look at verse 5, he says, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders. All right? So there's some things that are wanting that they didn't have. And one of the things that we talked about with that is what? It's the process of edification. The edification process of a believer. And where do we find that? Well, you find it in Romans chapter 16, 25 and 26. You also find that in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. 
there's, there's things that we have there. You've got doctrine, right? You've got reproof. You've got correction. And you've got instruction in righteousness, all right? And all that stuff goes together, and that's all Scripture, right? We know all Scripture is given by inspiration to God. It's profitable for those things. That's the purpose that we have God's Word. And how is it that that stuff works through is how? Paul's Gospel. Right? Paul's Gospel. The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And then what? The Scriptures of the Prophets. All right, so you've got those three things, and what those three things cover all that stuff right there. And so what we find out is the edification process that we're given is we need to find out what Paul's gospel is, because that's the issue, right? And one of the things we've talked about before is if you get the gospel wrong, then nothing else matters. Honestly, if you've got a church and they don't have the right gospel, there's no reason for them to have a church. There's no reason for them to go through all the paperwork that they would have to go through to declare themselves a church and say that we're a 501c3 and they go through all that stuff and do this stuff. If they don't get that right, they don't need to be around. Simple as that. If you don't get that right, then the rest of this isn't going to happen. Because what we know is we go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, right? And we find out that the natural man doesn't understand this Bible and can understand it because the only person that can understand it is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit teaches us. And if you ain't got the Holy Spirit in you, he's not teaching you anything. So if you've got somebody who says that they go to a church, but they're, they don't have this, they're not going to understand their Bible. It's not going to happen. They don't have the gospel. So, if you don't understand that, then you're not going to understand the teaching of Jesus Christ and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Well, where do we find that at? Books of Romans through Philemon, right? And then we can talk about <coughs> Scripture of the Prophets. And we've talked about this before. There's different applications to that. Um, and we won't go through that because we've already done that. But if you don't get this right, you can't get the rest right. It's impossible. Impossible. Um, Ronnie and I were talking last night. He says, how can, how can anybody say they're a dispensationalist and not use the King James Bible? And you've got mid-axe dispensationalist guys who call themselves mid-axe dispensationalist guys that use ESVs, NIVs, New King James Bibles. They've got Bibles that's taken out the word study in 2 Timothy 2, 15. They've got books that have taken out the word dispensation in Ephesians chapter 3 and the other places that we find it. How can you teach that? How can you teach something if you don't know it? We've talked about that before. How can you teach a gospel if you don't know it? How can you teach the, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery if you don't know what the revelation of the mystery is? You can't teach what you don't know. You can't live what you don't know. And that's the point here as we go down through here. Paul is saying, set these things in order and what's going to happen is you're going to be able to do what? Ordain elders. People that are established in the truth that you can actually do something with. And then he says, Here's, here are the, uh, the expectations or qualifications that you have. And that's where we've gotten to, gone down through, and we continue on in verse 14 with those things. But notice... <clears throat> Um, verse verse 13, all right, so this is right after Paul's telling Titus, by the way, um, everybody there is a liar. In fact, one of their own people says that they're all liars, all right? He says they're, they're always, they were always liars. By the way, in verse 12, notice he says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars. Notice that that doesn't say always liars. Is there a big is there a difference between always and always? Think about this. How often how often do they lie? In every possible manner. 
So when he says they are, the Cretans are all way liars, it's not just that they lie, it's just in every possible facet of life. Yeah, it's not all the time, but every facet of life, they lie. Um, they're evil beasts, slow bellies. And we talked about that a little bit last week. But notice in verse 13, he says, This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. All right. So that was one of the things we talked about last week. What does it mean to rebuke? All right. So we talked about uh, being able to reprove. What's the, what's the issue there? How is it that Titus is going to be able to fix that stuff is what? If you've got people down here, and, and you notice you notice in verse 10, um, he says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Uh, we've got some people down here that are teaching um, false doctrine. Um, that always reminds. I don't know why it does. Well, I know why it does. So every day, every day at school in the hallway, Monte he comes up, stands next to me, and um, there, there's a kid that walks by, and he says, "Your church, false doctrine. You need to go to Mr. Research Church." And I'm like, "You need to quit saying that." <laughs> well, you're gonna get me. You're gonna get me now. But I mean, you know, he he's. He knows a little bit about what's going on. So he, he messaged me last night, said he wasn't going to be able to be here because of something with his family. And I told him, I was like, that's fine. We're going to be here. When you come, we're sure you're going to be here. Um, but I said, in the meantime, keep reading the book of Romans. So just keep reading it over and over again. And he said he would. So, um, but, but the issue here is you've got those people, the false doctrine people right here. right? And that's, that's who he's dealing with. But notice he says, verse 13, This witness is true, where, wherefore rebuke them sharply. So all the people that he's been talking about that are the, the people who are subverting whole houses, uh, teaching things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, uh, just to get money and things like that. Um, I was watching a video this morning. I forget who had posted it. Somebody posted it on Facebook. And I've seen part of it before. And it was over in South Africa. And they had this preacher standing up and healing people, right? Well, they're talking to a, a girl that they said, uh, we're going to pull you up on stage. And they talked to her days before, and they paid her money. They found it, you know, here's the weird thing. So they found out that she was behind on her rent, and her landlord was going to kick her out. And so they've got people that go around looking for people like that that need money. Desperate. Desperate. And so they go looking for people that need money and said, hey, we're going to give you X amount of dollars. All we need you to do is show up, stand next to the preacher, and he's going to tell you or tell everybody what you've gone through and what you've been healed of. So this woman, um, they actually do take her to a clinic. Um, she receives a clean bill of health saying, that, and here's the thing that they were saying, is that God healed her of HIV. All right, so she goes to the clinic, she gets a blood test done, they get it back, says she's HIV negative, and so what they do is they bring her up on stage and say, uh, this woman three days ago had HIV, she came to us, we healed her, and here's the proof that she's now HIV negative. The proof that she was <laughs> there was no proof that she was HIV positive, but that's what they're doing. So they're taking this money and they're paying people to come up and the person doesn't even have to say that they've had it. They're going to tell them. And in fact, they told the lady, says, don't say anything. And the girl said, I've never had it. So what they're doing is they're putting up this false view of this is what God's doing. And he's not. Um, and it's for money. It's just to get money. To get people to pay money to get healed. And that's all they do. Um, and we see that stuff all the time, so we're not shocked by that. But they were actually talking to one of the guys whose job is to go and recruit people to bring them in to say that you've been healed. And so you're just watching that, and you're thinking, okay, that, we're not shocked by that. But the problem is, unbelieving people out there, they look at that and say, that's Christianity, and I don't have anything to do with it. All right, we're going to see that's exactly what's going on down here. A little bit later on, but it's this stuff right here, all right? So this is what Paul's telling Titus about in Crete. In Crete. 
Notice, he says, wherefore rebuke them sharply. How is it that you can fix false doctrine? Well, the way you fix false doctrine is what? Get good doctrine. And again, you know, we've talked about this before. You go over to Romans 14. We talked about um, Romans 14. What's he say? Go over to Romans 14 real quick. Um, we'd spent some time. We'd spent some time on this, and we'll look at we'll look at something. Romans chapter 14. <clears throat> Verse 1, him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Now I want you to think about something real quick. Think about what we're talking about. Um, so you've got somebody over here who is strong in the faith, and you've got this person down here. Whoops. I do. That looks better, doesn't it? So then you've got somebody that's weak in the faith. That's why they're teaching false doctrine. All right. So what's he say? Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputation. Don't go tell this person, hey, you're weak and you're dumb and you're not paying attention to what's going on. Haven't you ever read? Don't you understand? This is what's going on. Look at this verse. Right. It's not to, not to just fight with somebody that leads to what? Doubt. That's the issue. Don't, don't receive them to doubtful disputation. Don't fight with them and fuss with them just to create doubt in their mind. And I, I feel that a lot of times that's what grace people do. Is It's just we want to fight with somebody to create doubt and make ourselves look smarter, whatever it may be. Um, but notice, he says, For one believeth that he may eat all things, and another who is weak eateth herbs. All right, so this person up here says, Hey, I can eat everything because I've read Paul's epistles. This person down here says, The only thing I can eat is herbs because what are they doing? What's the weak person doing? They're living back here, and the strong person's living over here. So what's the weak person, what's the strong person over here need to do with the weak person? Do we just say, well, don't you understand? You don't believe your Bible. No. You know, he goes down and talks about eating. Then he talks about uh, verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another man or another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded. This person over here says, every day is the same. This person over here says, yeah, but... Saturday Sabbath, we have to do, we have to go to church on Saturday because that's the Sabbath. And they start talking about that. And then, what's this person over here do? Here's the issue. When he says, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind, it's not, well, you can believe what you want. That's not the issue. If you've got a verse, you say, I believe that this, what this verse is, this is the verse and I'm going to believe it. Let them believe it. I've said it before. This is America. You're free to be wrong. It's okay. All right? But if they say, well, this verse over here, for instance, one of the things I saw this morning, you can go back over here to Matthew chapter 6 and say, well, I'm just going to forgive people that I want to forgive because God's going to forgive me if I don't. Or if I won't forgive me if I don't forgive them. Well, you can go and you can say, well, I'm going to believe that verse. Okay? If you're fully persuaded, the problem is, is most people aren't fully persuaded. The problem is, is most people just parrot what they've heard. And Ronnie and I were talking about that last night. Somebody could say, well, all I know is Matthew chapter 6. Well, somebody could come along and say, all I know, and we've got, a, we've got an instance in Acts about it. There's a guy that says, all I know is the baptism of John. So I'm going to go baptize people. What's going to stop me? I can do, I can do it because Jesus was baptized, so why don't I baptize? All right, so then we start thinking about those things. They got a verse for it. Let them be fully persuaded. But we've got to look at how we go about doing those things, right? And that's the issue. How is it that we fix their false 
doctrine for the weaker brethren, the one who thinks you have to go to church on Sunday and that, or Saturday or even Sunday and say, well, this day is better than this day or, you know, my birthday is more important than everybody else's birthday or my birthday is the only day that matters or, you know, whatever it may be or Christmas and whatever. Uh, or you might have this person over here saying, well, I'm just going to forgive this way. Or you've got another person say, well, I want to water baptize. Um, how is it that we fix it? Do we go and say, well, you don't know what you're talking about and create doubt? No. How do we fix it? You take that person and show them doctrine. And we'll, we'll see some of those things as we go down through here. This is, this is what's going to take place. But notice, he says, where them sharply. Why? That they may be sound in the faith. Well, what's that mean? If they're if they're teaching false doctrine, they're weak, they're what? Not sound. That's the implication there. They're not sound in the faith. They don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know what they have in Christ. They don't know that they've been completely and totally forgiven of all sins, past, present, and future. They probably, they don't know that there is absolutely no need for a water baptism today. Right? They don't know that every day is exactly the same. And we don't esteem one day above another. They don't know that. So how is it that we get them to know that? Well, he says, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith. How is it that you do that? It's the edification process. How do you... Just use this. So I've gotten, I've, I've, I've been thinking about this lately. Um, most of the time, most of the time, what we, what we like to do is, um, you know, we talk about baptism. Is it better to say, um, here's these baptisms over here, and there's this baptism over here? Um, let's talk about the difference between those. What happens is if we do that, what are we doing? I feel that we create doubt in people. Wouldn't it be better just to say, hey, you know what? Ephesians 4 says there's one baptism. Who is it that tells us there's one baptism? Paul. Well, let's go find out what Paul says that baptism is. Well, we go over to 1 Corinthians 12 and we find out, hey, that baptism is a spirit baptism. Wouldn't it be better just to say, hey, here's how we baptize. Here's the doctrine of the baptism. Do we need to say what you believe is wrong and here's what's right? How about we just say, here's what's right? Just show them the verses. Here's the verses. Then we're not arguing with each other and and. Unless they continue to argue, and then what happens is, after the second or third admonition, you let them go. But it's not, here's, here's your wrong, here's why you're wrong, now let me tell you now why I'm right, because now who's the authority? I am, not the book. So how do we go about doing it? We do it exactly what Paul is telling Titus to do, exactly what he's doing. What? Edification process. We've seen him use Titus in each one of these instances. We've already looked at that. So that's how we do it. Do we worry about, um, you know, what you're teaching is wrong, so here's what's right? Or do we just say, hey, here's the verses, because nine times out of ten, do you think most Baptist preachers have ever seen 1 Corinthians chapter 12? If they did, they overlooked it. If they did, they overlooked it. If they did sit, they either overlooked it or they said, well, that's water. So then we start looking at some of those things. And then, you know, something I've been thinking about lately is just put the truth out there of what we know is going on today and don't fight about it. Now, does it feel good sometimes? Yeah, but that's the problem. It feels good. What do we know about our emotions? Our emotions are ignorant. Our emotions are stupid. They don't know anything. They, our emotions react upon um, things in our lives, whatever it is in our lives, right? 
And, and so how is it that we fix the false doctrine? How is it that we make a weak person strong? How's it, how, what do we do to make a person that's not sound in the faith to be sound in the faith? Well, how about we give them the faith? What's the faith? Faith is that body of doctrine delivered to and through the Apostle Paul. So we say, okay, um, so you're not forgiven? All right. Um, well, let's just look at Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at Colossians. Let's just take a look at this. What do those verses tell you about your forgiveness? Just go with the truth. Don't say, well, you're wrong, and here's 18 reasons why. All right, and that's one of those things that I want, you know, I've been thinking about lately. How is it that we fix that stuff is the edification process. That's what we're looking at, all right? Notice, <clears throat> what does it mean, and, and Paul gives us a definition of what, is it, what it means to be sound in the faith. All right, notice, he says, um, Wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Notice, what does it mean to be sound in the faith? Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men. So do you know what it means to be sound in the faith? Not giving heed, not paying attention to Jewish fables and commandments of men. All right, so what is it that, and I want you to think about this. What is it that Paul's telling Titus that he's going to have to face here at Crete? You've got circumcision, right? Isn't that what, he's, isn't that what he says in verse 10? For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. What is it that they're, that they're going around telling people? Jewish fables and what? Commandments of men. Here are things that you have to do. And that's exactly, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at some of those here in just a minute. But, but what does it mean to be sound in the faith is not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men. What's the result of not being sound in the faith? Notice, that turn from the truth. So when we, when we look at this, <clears throat> you've got people that's not sound in the, in the faith, but they turn from the truth. All right? So what is it that the weak brethren, what is it the not sound people are doing? They're teaching a false doctrine. They're, they're te they might be teaching um, you can only eat certain types of things. Well, it was good enough for Adam, it's good enough for me. Well, which, which diet are you going to go by that God gave Adam? You know, think about that. Um, or they might say, well, I want to be baptized, whatever it may be. And we're going to take a look at what, what happens with those folks down here. But what, what's going on is what? If you're sound in the faith, you're not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. The result of that stuff is it turns you away from the truth. Let's take a look at a couple of these things real quick. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> and we, we see this stuff again. And it's nothing new that Paul is having to deal with this stuff. In fact, he deals with it with, with Timothy, right? First Timothy chapter 1, um, verse 2. Um, says unto Timothy, My own son in the faith, and that faith there, the faith, that he's talking about the faith there, that's the same faith that he's talking about over here in Titus. All right? That body of doctrine delivered to and through the apostle Paul. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, uh, and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to buy still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and to endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a faith unfeigned, from which some having swerved have turned aside into vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. And he continues on talking about how to use the, the, the law lawfully. Now there's a few things here that we look at and notice he says, 
I want you to charge some that they teach no other doctrine, right? So he's saying, don't teach any other doctrine other than what you've been taught, right? So that's that doctrine, that same thing that we've been talking about, that faith. He says, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. What is it that fables and endless genealogies, what is it that they produce? What's he say it produces? Which minister questions rather than godly edifying. What is it that if you tell somebody um, some story? Um, I was telling Ronnie last night, I was, I was watching this video the other day, and this guy said, um, God, God wants to have, God, what was it? <clears throat> God wants you to look for encounters with him this year in 2020 looking for an encounter with God. Uh, and then he says, you know, back in Isaiah, the way, he, the way it was with Isaiah, it was an encounter with God. And he had no verses to talk about. In fact, it almost felt like the guy had no idea what verse he was talking about or what chapter he was talking about in Isaiah. Because there was nothing there. There was no meat there. There wasn't even milk there. It was rancid milk that's been left out for three weeks. That's how bad that was. He was like, you know, just as Isaiah had an encounter with God, that's what God wants to have for you today, is an encounter with Him. An encounter with and he just kept saying that. And I'm thinking, this guy said absolutely nothing. Do you know what he's done? He's here. He's telling stories, fables. And you see, what's, he, what's, he, what's Paul say down here in verse 7? Desiring to be teacher of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. He had no idea what he's talking about, and he didn't even know the verse to go to. How often have you ran into somebody and says, uh, you know, it says somewhere in the Bible this, this, and this. And you say, well, what verse? I don't know. It's just in there. You know what? That's a person that doesn't know what they say, nor where have they affirm. They have no idea where to find it. They don't even understand what they're saying. They're just saying things that they've heard. And so then, what I want us to be able to do is be able to say, here's what I believe and here's why. Let me show you the verses why. And we're able to do that. But what is it that this does is it genders or um, ministers questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith so do. So what happens is up here, you have what? Godly edifying. What happens down here is what? Questions. Which lead to what? Doubt. But notice in verse 5, now the end of the commandment, and, and here's what he's saying, here's the goal of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. How is it that we should go about helping these people out is by is with charity just show them the verses right it's not and we've talked about this before and we've spent a lot of time on that um, go to chapter 4 first Timothy chapter 4 <clears throat> first Timothy chapter 4 <clears throat> Notice verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. But well, what's that faith that he's talking about? It's that body of doctrine given to Paul, right? What happens when you depart from the faith is giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now that verse is always, has always kind of jumped out at me. When you talk about your conscience being seared with a hot iron. Um, when, you, when you start thinking about things, and I'm thinking about that guy that was in South Africa who's paying these people, do you think it bothers his conscience that he does that? Now it doesn't. I would say probably the first couple times he did it, he probably thought, man, I probably shouldn't be doing this. But what's happened over time is what's happened is what? His conscience has been seared with a hot iron. And what happens is, um, I, know, I know none of us here has ever had this 
Uh, I know there's some there's some sororities that uh, instead of getting a tattoo to be a member of the sorority, they'll they'll brand you, and they'll brand you in the arm, and it's a it's a horseshoe type thing. Fraternity, my bad. Fraternity. Well, some sororities might. Well, some places in the world. Um, you know, you think about <clears throat> what happens is you get to the point where it doesn't even bother you to do the stuff that you're doing. And that's what he's talking about here. These people have been teaching this, this wrong doctrine, this false doctrine for so long, it doesn't even bother them now if you do bring up something that's different. It's like they just kind of dismiss it. <clears throat> but what happens here is, he says, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They've just gotten to the point it doesn't even bother them that they're not teaching what they're supposed to be teaching. Um, Notice verse 3, and he gives you some examples. Forbidding to marriage, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Do you know what that means? You can eat everything, anything that you want to. You're not, you don't have to worry about if something's been offered to, to an idol or not. Back then you would have. You could eat shellfish if you want to. I don't know why you'd want to, but if you want to, you can. Um, bacon. You know, we walk in here Sunday mornings, and it smells like bacon from, from the room where they're cooking. This morning, it was extremely strong bacon smell. Um, I think we were, con we, were, we were considering that that's all it was cooked this morning was just bacon. Um, we cooked bacon in our house, and it smelled like it for a few days. You can eat bacon today. Um, and that's not something that, that you can't do. But what these people do is, we well, can't eat bacon. And people are doing it. Do they have a verse for that? Yeah. But notice what he says. Um, which, um, which God hath uh, created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now, here's the issue. Is there truth in God's word that says don't eat ham? Pork. Yes. So, is there a truth that says that? Yes. Is there another truth that says you can eat anything that you want to? Yes. Well, how do you reconcile those two things? This right here. Revelation of the mystery fixes it. So I know, hey, I can eat it. Back here I didn't, I couldn't. So which one am I going to follow? Well, if I'm not... If I'm not this person back here, but I'm this person over here, then I should probably change who I think I am and understand some things. Do you know what that is? That's called repentance. Changing your mind about something. It's okay to do. Um, and that's, that's one of those things we see as we go down through here. That's what he's talking about. In verse 4, notice he says, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Well, I won't receive shellfish with thanksgiving, so I don't want to eat it. No. But I mean, that's the idea, is right? Everything that God's made, it's good. And nothing to be refused. It's not this back here, where you couldn't eat certain types of animals. And the way you fix that is understanding the doctrine. Um, if we drop down to verse 7, he continues on with this. Um, <clears throat> he's talking about the good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained in verse 6. Verse 7, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto what? Godliness. Well, that brings up a very important uh, point. What is the godliness that he's talking about? Well, he just got through talking about it in chapter 3. Right? What do we notice? He's talking about the church in, ch in chapter 3. Here's, the, here's, how the, here's how the local assembly is supposed to work. Here's the, 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 the bishop and the deacons, and here's, here's their qualifications. And then he says in verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of what? Godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, uh, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And we've talked about that verse before. 
that mystery of godliness is the fact that God has chosen to make himself known through our flesh today. We can go through the verses, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, right? The life that I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved, who, who loved, I just messed that up. But it's him living his life through us, right? That's the issue. That's what he's talking about. So when you look at chapter 4, verse 7, he says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto what? This stuff right here. That's where you find godliness. And we're, we're going to see something starkly different than that here in just a minute. Notice verse 8, and here's what it comes down to. For bodily exercise profiteth little. Now I want you to think about that for a second. That's not talking about you shouldn't go to the gym because you don't get anything out of going to the gym. He's not talking about bodily exercise as far as going to the gym or working out and stuff like that. He's talking about you can't do anything in your life to produce godliness. We can't do it. We can't eat the right things. We can't be baptized in water. We can't forgive people so that we can be forgiven. We can't do these things back here. We can't speak in tongues. We can't do those things and expect that to be, an, to be a profit for us. It's not, it profiteth little. Notice, but godliness is profitable unto what? All things. So then, where is it that we find godliness being taught is right there. In fact, Paul calls it the mystery of godliness. Here is something that God's kept secret from before the foundation of the world. He's revealing today in the, in the books of Romans 3, 5, 11. And he says, here's the mystery of godliness. God has chosen to make himself manifest in our flesh. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we see this. Notice, <clears throat> it's profitable unto all things. Why is it profitable having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come? This is a faithful uh, saying and worthy of all acceptation. And he goes down through there. But what do we see there? It's profitable. Why is it profitable? Because it has a promise of the life that's now, that's God living through you now, and the life that's possible in the ages to come where God's going to glorify himself through you. Do you know what the difference is? Do you know what eating certain things, being dunked in water, uh, the forgiveness stuff, speaking in tongues, do you know what that stuff does? None of that stuff has the promise of life that's now where it's God living in you. Just because somebody goes to a church and gives money to the church and goes on a mission trip, I, anyway, I'm not going to get that. Just because you go and do things doesn't mean you're godly. Those things profit little because those things don't have the promise of life. Now and the life that's to come. Those things will not produce. The only thing that will produce it is this right here. The edification. And that's the whole issue in Titus at the very beginning. Because there's some things that's going to come out from that. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> and again, this, is, this isn't anything new, but the fables and all that stuff. Second uh, Timothy chapter 4 we looked at this verse last time or the time before verse 2 preach the word be instant in season out of season what reprove rebuke exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears Notice, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Use everything you've learned, Timothy. 
to do the work you're supposed to do, which is what? Get people saved, bring them to the knowledge of the truth. Well, there's two issues with that. In order to get people saved, you first have to be what? Saved yourself. You've got to get the right gospel. Second of all, in order to teach somebody and bring them to the knowledge of the truth, you would have to have been brought to the knowledge of the truth yourself, right? You have to know some stuff. And as I've said before, we've said it, we've said it time and time again. You cannot teach what you don't know. Also, you cannot live what you don't know. Can you live as a person forgiven if you don't know that you've been forgiven? No. Can you live a, can you live a life of a person that does not have to do this, 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 and this if you don't know that you don't have to do this, 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 and this? You can't do it. All right? And so what happens is, what do they do? They turn to fables, old wives' tales, all that stuff, which is why nobody's here and they're all down at the Baptist church. Because he's going, to give them, he's going to give them fables, he's going to give them things, he's going to tell them stuff. Now, we know this is true. Right? And that's the basis of this stuff. So that's the fable stuff. Let's take a look at something else. Go to Isaiah chapter 29. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 29. <clears throat> and, you know, when we were talking about those that, that desire to be teachers of the law and don't know what they teach and nor what they affirm, I see them here in this book, in this verse in, in Isaiah. Isaiah 29. <clears throat> Let's look at, start off at verse 9. So Isaiah 29, verse 9. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets of your rulers, the seers hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. I want you to think about that for a second. God has, has poured upon them the spirit of a deep sleep. He's closed their eyes. The prophets and the rulers, the seers, He's covered them. And the vision that they have um, of, of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed. I want you to think about that for a second. If they were able to see, could they get the book out and open it up and read it? He's saying it's been sealed. That's the way you're looking at it. The words that are sealed. He's saying as if, as if this is your Bible. He's put a seal on it and you can't open it up. He's hiding it from them. And we'll see why. So when, when they're walking around, they're staggering around, they're drunken but not with wine, they stagger but not with strong drink, the reason why is because they're what? They're weak and beggarly. Well, Paul tells us that the things of the law are weak and beggarly, right? We, we understand that. But notice, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and their lips do honor me, and have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of who? Men. So what do we notice here? You've got learned people and unlearned people that are what? One says, I can't read the book because it's sealed. The other one says, I can't read the book because I'm unlearned. All right? Both of them are down here. All right? And so we keep on going. Because he's talking about the nation of Israel here. And, and we, see, we see what's going on. Notice what he says. Uh, verse 13, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouths, what do they do? 
well, I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing, you know, God, God's working in my life to do this and this is a God thing and all this. And they try to draw near Him with their mouth by the stuff that they say. And He says, and with their lips do honor me. And they'll say stuff. But what do we notice? <clears throat> but have removed their heart far, far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. So what happens is They've, they're, they're, not, they're not sound, they're weak, they've, they've, they've questioned things that's, that's, that's created doubt, and that's the opposite of, of faith. And so then when we see this, what's he say? They, they but have removed their heart, their heart from, uh, far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. What is it that they're basing their information on? Is what? The commandments of man. Things that man's come along and said, hey, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you should do this, should do this. And what they've done is it's created a group of people that are weak. They're, sound, they're not sound in the faith. And we see this over and over again. We go to Matthew chapter 15. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 15. And we see it. <clears throat> We see Isaiah being brought to life right here in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15. <clears throat> Jesus, is, Jesus Christ is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, talking about the traditions that they have, their commandments that they're following. Um, notice in verse, verse 3. It says, But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him, uh, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father uh, or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. So what is it? You have the commandment of God up here, what do you have down here? Tradition. What does this tradition do for that particular person? It makes the commandment of God of none effect. Again, if you don't know this, but you know this, you can't live this. Right? And that's Jesus Christ is telling them. Here's the thing. Notice in verse, verse 8. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me. I want you to think about that for a second, verse 9. But in vain. What, is it to me, what does it mean to be vain? It's empty, worthless. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. What are they doing? Here's the tradition. This is what we're supposed to do. We do it this way. Somebody comes along and says, yeah, but God says this. They say, no. Tradition is the issue. <clears throat> why is it most people, and we'll just pick on this for now, but why is it most people like to go back here and get water baptized? What's their reasoning? Most of the time is what? Good enough for Jesus, good enough for me. Because that's what their tradition in their church is taught. So then we see that those things, you know, some stuff have changed. Go to Mark chapter 7. But if they don't know that stuff has changed, if they don't understand that things have changed, how can they understand really what's going on? <clears throat> I skipped all over Mark. I went to Luke. Mark chapter 7. <clears throat> Mark chapter 7, um, verse 7. <clears throat> we see it again. This is the exact same, exact same story that we see here. Mark chapter 7, verse 7. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Drop down to verse uh, 13. Notice, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Now I want you to think of something real quick. Um, 
What was it? What was it that Jesus said in Matthew 15? It was what the what commandment. The commandments of God that make that they make none effect, right? Isn't that what it said? Notice in chapter chapter seven of Mark, verse thirteen, what's he say? Making the what? Word of God of none effect. So just because you've got commandments, does that automatically mean the Ten Commandments? What's he saying? What is his commandments? It's his word. Right? So we see he uses those two, two terms interchangeably. And that's an okay thing. So what do we find out the commandments of God are? They're the word of God. We see that. Jesus Christ interprets that for us. So the commandments of God, or the commandment of God is the word of God. We see that right here in those two verses. So then let's run over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. My phone that buzzed. Probably. Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> Verse 20. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ. Question. Are you dead with Christ? Where do we find that out at? Do we find it out back here anywhere? No. Where do we find it? Specifically, we find it in Romans chapter 6, right? That's that baptism that we have, that we're, cruci that we're, we're crucified with Him. His death is our death. He says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ, from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? It's a good question. So, person, why am I subject to your tradition when I'm dead with Christ? I'm not, I'm not subject to your tradition. You think about that for a second. The tradition we found is what? It's the commandments of man. It's the word of man. It's what man teaches. That's, that's those traditions and what, what Jesus Christ was telling the, the scribes and the Pharisees is what? Your traditions make the commandments of God and the word of God of none effect to you. Because you care more about those traditions. So what do we see here? If, if, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? Notice what Paul says. Do you know what an adult strong, sound, godly person would say about those things, touch not, taste not, handle not. So what do you do with these traditions? Don't try them out. Don't be a part of them. Why? Because those things profiteth little. But what does godly edifying do? Profiteth all. Notice, which all thing, which, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. So I want you to think about this real quick. We, we started off last week with this. We talked about Adam and Eve in the garden, right? <clears throat> and how um, I'm under the impression that they were clothed with a garment of light, which would have been God's glory. And then they were what? Naked. They noticed they were naked. What did they do? They covered themselves up. What did they cover themselves up with? Fig leaves. What, a ha what happens to a leaf when you take it off the tree? It, it withers and dies. And then it what? you got to replace it. That's what he's talking about here. The moment that you do something, the moment you eat this thing, well, I've got to follow the thing. What's it do? It's perished. It's worthless. The moment that you get dunked in water, what's that done for you? The moment you've done it, what's he say right here? It does. 
it's uh, which are all to perish with the using. As soon as you use it, as soon as it's done, it's not worth anything. Why? Because it profits little. It doesn't do any profit. Um, speaking of tongues, all this stuff over here, what does that stuff do? It perishes. It goes away. I'm almost convinced, and I'm not really studied this out, but I'm almost convinced completely, I'm not studied it out, but I'm almost convinced that the church experience is a high that people search for that can't be fixed. Do you know why people move from one church to another? Do you know why people don't show up here? Because we don't give them a high. You got to do work when you show up here. It's not an encounter with God. It's not, it's not a thing that, that you walk out like, whew, I feel good, let's go do something. And then you go home and you sleep. And then the next week, you're like, you start itching. I've got to get that high, I can't wait till Sunday. And we don't offer them that because we know that those things perish. But what doesn't perish at God the edifying, which is what we're doing right now. So, and I want you to think about this. What's the best way to talk to an addict? Is it to tell them, you're stupid, you don't know what's going on, don't you know how great my life is? Wouldn't you love to be just like me? We don't do that. What do you do with an addict? This stuff right here. How do you, fi how do you fix a church addict? I guess that'll be the title of this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not good with message titles, but... How to fix the church addict. How do you do that? You got people here. How do you fix it? With doctrine. You don't beat them up. Yeah. I'm not getting what I need, so I need to go somewhere else. Yeah, so it's just, well, I, I'm missing, you know. Well, you don't have the speaking in tongues? I don't know if I can come there. You don't baptize? Well, I'm not going to come there. If you don't speak in tongues, you're probably not saved. Yeah, yeah. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. You've not gotten that second blessing. You ain't got the second Holy Ghost blessing. You know, you've got all that stuff out there. And people don't understand what they say, nor what they affirm. They can't show you anything. They just parrot this stuff. And I hear this all the time. You only, how, how many people y'all have? How many people show up? That's not the issue. You meet at a, at a conference room in a hotel? You don't have a church building? You don't have a choir stand? Yeah, you don't have a choir stand? I mean, whatever it may be. What, what those things do, the commandments and doctrines of the men, what they do is they perish the moment that you use them and you've got to replace it with something else. And usually it's not getting in the book and reading it. It's not getting in the book and studying it. That's too much work. Now, you give me an app and let me listen to somebody reading the Bible, I'll do that. But There is a difference in listening to somebody read it to you and you actually, in the quietness of your own home, find a place to pick up that Bible and read it. It does, you know, I've said this before, it does a tremendous thing because when Paul says in Ephesians 3, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Do you know how you, do you know the easiest way to learn about the mystery of Christ is read? That's what Paul says. That's what God through Paul says. The way you're going to understand the mystery, the exact same way that Paul knows it, is you read the book. That's all it is. And what reading the book does is gets rid of this stuff. Do you know how I know? It did for me. It's doing it for Bruce. Delilah. She grew up in a grace church and she's still learned more since we've been meeting than, they ever, than she ever did growing up there. And I know because I was in that church for years. There are things that we've learned over the past few years since we've left that church that we didn't know, and they're a grace church. Mike and Renee tell you the same thing. They've come out of some stuff 
Ronnie can. Everybody watching. I don't know who all is on, but whoever's watching, every one of us probably has a story of the things that we came out of and the way that we got out is because we read stuff. Not because somebody came around and just beat us over the head. But the way that we get rid of tradition... Yeah. I've never seen that. It's been there for 2,000 years. It's been, it's, been, it's been written down in your book in the English language for over 500 years. It's been there before you came along. It's going to be there after you die. Religion will try and prevent you from seeing it. Yeah, they'll get you the wrong book. And so then when you've got churches... And when I hear Grace Churches that's not using the King James Bible, that makes me cringe. How can you not? The book that opened it up to you was the King James Bible. How in the world are you going to teach it out of a book that doesn't have it, that tries to hide it? it blows my mind. So when we see this stuff, how do you get rid of tradition? How do you get rid of weakness? How do you get rid of unsoundness? How do you get rid of questions? How do you get rid of the doctors of men? How do you get rid of doubt? It's through the Word of God, rightly divided. Reading it. You read it. But notice in verse 23, he says, Which things, those things that he's talking about, have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship. Now look at all the, th all the things that I've done. I've done this, 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 and this. Look at me. That's what they do. It's a show of wisdom and will worship and humility. How often, how often do you hear people well, I'm just humbled by God doing this. I don't understand what God has in, in store for this flat tire, but I know He's got a plan, and I'm just, I'm just humble enough to be a part. You know, I don't know. You can be humbled, but notice the humbling here comes from what? Show of, will, wisdom, uh, of, of, of wisdom and will worship and humility. It's a false humility. It's not like, you know, <clears throat> when I tell Ronnie or RL or, or Mike or Nate, whoever it is, anybody that's, that's ever put money into or, or helped us out in any way, it's humbling for me because, but it's not, a, it's not a false humility. It's not a, it's not about me because it's about the book. It's about the message. That's why people give their time and their money and their effort and their thought and stuff and all that stuff is because the book, it's not because of me, it's because of the book. And we see that. But this is somebody doing stuff and they're saying, well, the only reason I did that is because I'm humble enough to do it. I'm humble enough to get down and, and, and wash somebody's feet. You know how many people ask me, it's like, do you all wash feet when you do communion? Well, Jesus did it, so why don't you? Yeah, Jesus ignored the Gentiles. Why don't you do that? Let's move to Israel. Let's go to Jerusalem. But, you know, those types of things. <clears throat> but it's, it's a false humility. It's a false will worship. Notice, and neglecting of the body, not in honor to the satisfying of the flesh. What is it that that will worship the humility, the neglecting of the body. What is that stuff? Why they do it? It's to the satisfying of the flesh to make themselves feel good. It's their fig leaf. Is what it is. And as soon as they use that fig leaf, what happens to it? It's gone. What do I need to do? Get another fig leaf. Well, I've been baptized. What's next? Well, now you got to go knock on doors. All right, I've knocked on doors. What's next? You know, we, we've talked about that before. The, the, the W's of, of, of traditional thinking is what? Win them, wet them, work them, and whip them. All right? You've gotten saved, all right? So now you need to be baptized. Now you've been baptized, we need you to do this. Clean the church floor. Um, mow the grass. Take a, take a Sunday school with the kids. That's the, that's the Protestant version of... Uh, I don't know if I should say this, but that's the Protestant version of purgatory. 
kids Sunday school teaching with the kids. Have you ever done it before? Those kids are crazy. <laughs> it was the Protestant version of purgatory. But then you've got that, but then you whip them. Well, you didn't do this. You didn't do this. Now we got to. Now I got to sit, sit back and hit you. And if the love of God doesn't constrain you, then nothing will. No amount of whipping, no amount of working can do that. What does it is what? Godly edifying. That book will do it. It's designed to do that for you. Now if we go back to Titus. <clears throat> chapter 1 verse 14. He says, Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. What is it that the fables and commandments of men do is it turns people away from holding close to the truth. Because you think about it, if you're down here, guess where you're not? Up here. And if you say, give me something, and in fact, I would almost say, the more, the more you give me here to do, the farther down you get. And that's what, that's what he's saying. That's basically what he's saying back in Isaiah. You're doing this stuff and you're turning yourself farther and farther away from God. And God's back here. You're like, I know I'm forgiven, but I need to go forgive somebody so I can get forgiveness. I know you've, I know you've baptized me and placed me into Christ, but I need this water ceremony. And that's what happens. And God's sitting over here thinking... I've already made you complete in my son. Just get over here and, and rest in what I've made you. And allow that to be the motivating factor because that's what chapter 2 is talking about once we get there. But notice in 15, under the pure, all things are pure. Now I want you to think about in the context here. Who do you think the pure are? Those that are holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. It's people that's holding fast to the faithful truth, to the faithful word. He says, Under the pure, all things are pure. Under them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Notice, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Now as you, as you go through there and you take a look at some of these things, <clears throat> um, what God wants us to do is to be turned towards His Word, not away from it. And what those stories, the fables... And what the commandments of men do, the religious tradition, what it does is it turns people away from the truth. And he says, Under the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. So I want you to notice something real quick. <clears throat> what is it that's defiled? Their mind and their conscience... And then they profess to know God, but by their works they deny Him. Do you know what happens? That what you've got there is your mind, that's the what? Spirit. Their conscience is their what? Soul. And in their works is their body. And you think about that. There's a, there's a correlation there. And we've talked about this. We've talked about this before. <clears throat> if you're not pure, so I want you to think about this real quick. If if um, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Who would be the defiled and unbelieving? The slow bellies, right? The the people that are teaching things. The, the Cretans, the rest of those guys that don't understand what's going on. When you think about that, you have the defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind, conscience, and, and conscience is defiled. Doesn't that remind you of um, 
that their conscience being seared with a hot iron, they get to the point where it doesn't bother them that they're not teaching what they're supposed to teach. Right? We think about that, and he says, they profess to know God. Isn't that what he said back in Isaiah, that they speak and they say, I love God, and God's done this, and this is what God's doing in my life, and I'm doing this because of God, and I'm going to this country because God wants me to go? They're, they might not even be saved. But they're saying these things, and he says what? Their heart's far from me. The heart is the issue. The heart, from Adam all the way through, has always been the issue. The heart issue is the problem. Where is your heart? Is your heart here? But you say you're here? Think about that for a second. How many people do we know of that their heart is here but with their lips, they're up here. There's people that's got charts that say the right things, but they're down here. Their heart's here. There's people that don't have the charts. There are people that are here by their heart, but they talk like they're up here. We can probably think of people in our minds, people that we know people that we work with that inside their spirit, soul, and body they're doing this stuff but they're saying that they know God but notice but in works they deny Him notice I want you to notice something real quick this reminds me. This reminds me of a couple things. One, let's get. Uh, it's almost time to quit. Go get Ephesians real quick. Can I do this in two minutes? Can I do this in ten minutes? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> All right, so Bruce has given me the go-ahead for another hour. So we're going to do um, Sunday school, Sunday message, and Sunday night message all at once. Now, we'll, we'll probably spend a little bit more time on this next week. But, but I want us to get a couple things real quick. What did I say? Ephesians? Did I already tell you Ephesians? Huh? Ephesians chapter 2. Yep. Yeah. Um, Get, get Ephesians chapter 2. We'll start off there. There's a bunch of places we could start, but we'll start there. Ephesians chapter 2. Let me get there. <clears throat> these, are, these are some verses that everybody knows. We could probably quote them, but I want us to see something. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. <clears throat> For by grace you save through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. Why, Paul? It's not of worse not of works lest any man should boast. Why is it why is salvation a gift? Because your works aren't good enough and if they were good enough what would you be able to do is say look at what I did to get saved. And you make the cross of Christ of none effect. You make the commandments of God of none effect, you make the word of God vain to you. But here's the thing. Notice in verse 10. This is the verse that a lot of people stop at. Verse 10. For we are His workmanship. Um, when you think about that, we are His workmanship created where? In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should what? So God has before ordained that we should walk in good works. That's what he says. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This is something that God has purposed in himself to be able to do, to use man to produce a life in our flesh that would be pleasing to him. 
and we would be able to, by the way, when you think about this workmanship, um, it's the idea of a skillful worker. As we go through this, what is it that he wants us to do? To be able to do what? Do good works. So when we read over in Titus chapter 1, what is it that, that he says in verse 16? They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. So would those be good works? No. So the good works that he's talking about here are works that He produces in our life as we walk by faith in what His Word says. How is it that you can produce good works without doing work? Think about that. How can you produce good works without doing work? You gotta read. So what does that do? So you think about that. Um, grab, uh, let's take a look at this real quick. Get, uh, get Philippians real quick. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 1, verse 4. Paul's talking about remembering the folks at Philippi. Verse 4, Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Notice, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a what? Good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, when you think about that, who is the he that's begun a good work in you? God. God is performing in you. He hath begun a good work in you. And how long will he perform that work? Until the day of Jesus Christ. Well, when is that? When he comes back at the rapture. That's a glorious thing to think about, isn't it? You don't have to do it. Read the book and you're going to find out what he's doing. Get out of his way and just read the book and find out what he's doing. Chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. When you start seeing these things, this stuff makes a little bit more sense. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 has often been used as a verse to say you have to work to gain salvation. But it's not. Notice in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence... Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now I want you to think about that. Does he, who is he talking to? He's talking to saved people. So is he telling saved people that they need to work to become saved? No, because they're already saved. What's he saying? Work out the salvation that you already have. How? With fear and trembling. For it is God, and here we see, which worketh what? In you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputations. The murmurings are the inner things, like you just talking to yourself, man, I just don't want to do this. And the outer is where you're telling and disputing with people. I, you just, you know. As we go through there, <clears throat> God's working in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Notice verse 15. Why, Paul, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So when we take a look at that, there's a whole bunch of things here, which is why I'm thinking we might have to do this next time. But What is it he's saying is making the issue there in verse 16 is what? Make the Bible the issue. Make the words on the page the issue. Allow that to be the thing to work in you. We all know the verse, right? First Thessalonians. How is it that God works in and through you 
to both will and to do of his good pleasure. You know, the thing about that is <clears throat> the word of God is going to work in you to the point that you choose to, by your own volition, to do that and then go do it. First, First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye have heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which what? Which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Question. Can you believe something if you don't know it? No. Can you teach something if you don't know it? No. Can you live something if you don't know it? No. So the way that the Word of God is going to work effectually in you is you have to what? Believe it. Which means you had to have to have what? Heard it. Or read it. Now here's the best part. <clears throat> we'll, we'll tie this up probably next week. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 3. We'll just read this, and then we'll, we'll, we'll see what's going on. Notice 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. Paul's talking about, In the last days perilous times shall come, and he's not talking about earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars. He's talking about people who are going to be lovers of their own selves. By the way, I see this stuff at school all the time. Girls and boys cannot get enough of themselves on their phone. Worst thing that ever Every five minutes, they're... What? There's a world outside of me and my phone? They're so enamored with their phone and themselves, it's not even funny. But that's this. And you notice in verse 5, here, here's what it comes down to. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. What's he say to Timothy? From such turn away. Why? For of this sort are they which what? Isn't that the same thing that we read about the folks over in Titus? They're going to subvert whole houses. How do they do that? They creep into houses and leave and lead captive silly, uh, captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lust, lust, ever learning, and never notice able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So here's what I want us to think about: What's our goal? Get people saved and bring them to the knowledge of the truth. Well, what happens with a lot of these people is what? They get so stuck in this stuff, what's he say? They're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's a horrible place to be. They have a form of godliness. They speak the things and say, look at what God's done in my life. Um, God's done this, and God's made this way possible, and God's opened this door, and God's closed this window, whatever it may be. And they speak these things and they look and sound like they're the, the thing. But what's he say? What are they denying? The power thereof. We're going to find out. We'll take a look at this next week. At the end of Titus there, notice Titus 1.16. Notice, they profess that they know God. They have a form of godliness. But in works they what? Deny Him. So they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Well, what's the power thereof? We find out it's the Scriptures. It's the Word. We'll take a look at that <clears throat> next week. And we'll finish that up. And then hopefully, the next week, Bruce will be ready to go. No, the, not next week, but the week after that. Yeah. All right. That's only 10 minutes over. Everybody still has time to go get groceries and stuff for the big game, right? The big game. The big game. Um, but I want to, you know, re remind yourself of these things. And I think, I think this, this stuff, what we're going through, makes a whole lot more sense out of verse 5 than a lot of people saying just set up the order as far as deacons and elders 
that's that's a that's the secondary issue. The main issue is getting them straight on the doctrine first, because that's what he's talking about all the way through here. But um, it is what it is. But questions, comments, concerns. Thank you. I appreciate you all too. It's great being here, isn't it? Um, like I said, I don't know who all is online, but thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being here. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to be here again Tuesday night. We've not had any problems except one one night. So, Yeah. Um, soon as the as soon as the apps go live for UTV radio, I'll let everybody know. Go download those. They should be free. I'm not going to get any money off of them. So it would be nice if we did. Go directly to the ministry, but... I'm a, I didn't even think about that. I would assume they're free. I'd say they are. I base. I basically. We basically paid for it, so it should be free, right? <laughs> um, but I think it is. So once those launch, I'll let everybody know. But other than, until then, you can check out the website, and you click on there. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for watching. Uh, until Tuesday night, grace and peace. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word. May we take the information today, study it out for ourselves, find out whether or not that's the, the information we've talked about this morning is so. Um, and when we do, our, our prayer is that we can take a look at, at where we are in our spiritual walk, um, the daily intake of proper sound doctrine. That's the issue, what it comes down to. Uh, and it's your word, once we read it and bring it into our, our thought process when we believe it, your word is going to do a work in us and produce the life of Christ in our flesh. And we're grateful and thankful that we get to be a part uh, of glorifying the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.